Canadian Grand Prix. Time to rise and shine and uh, get all set for what is going to be a beautiful day. Uh, the weatherman has promised us the ideal conditions are going to hang around uh, pretty much throughout the entire day. So we have finally got it this year. Of course, uh, grab your breakfast now. Uh, make sure the campfires are up. Flash on in your programs and your souvenirs. And uh, make sure you can uh, gain a good vantage point as well. Okay, if you see clouds are beginning to arrive through the happy flash and uh, so close to the edge, we wrap his frail body in the golden shroud of legend, the invincibility of myth. The Grand Prix story is a tale of romance, chivalry, daring, skill, and courage. Unbelievable courage. It begins in the twilight years of the 1800s with the invention of the motor car. capable of extreme speeds on circuits designed to retain the flavor of the early days of open road racing. But you won't find a cow strolling across this race course. Only the purity of world-class racing with men like James Hunt, Nicky Lauda, Clay Regazzoni, Jody Schechter, Mario Andretti, today's living legends. Possesses, centrifugal force will throw car and man off the track. Yes, the flavor of an earlier era remains in the layout of today's Grand Prix circuits, but the speed and power of modern Grand Prix cars has forced an evolution in race course design necessary to contain these awesome aluminum and fiberglass beasts. Precision machines requiring precision preparation and the same old mechanical skill that has always been so important in Grand Prix racing. A skill that in the early days was very clear. Form follows function. And as yesterday's racing draft horses evolved into today's thoroughbreds, so too did the mechanics craft evolve to a supreme, if more functional, level. John Surtees has been in racing most of his life as a motorcycle racer, as a Grand Prix driver, and now as a team owner. It's a seven-day-a-week sort of job if somebody looked at it that way. I mean, look at my mechanics, and every race mechanic, he's virtually working seven days a week for everything except for about six weeks a year, at the very most, because the racing program is so very, very tight. But, of course, it's not a really a sacrifice because they're doing something which they enjoy. And uh, people use the word dedication and such like, but I think in some ways um, we miss out because of the fact that we live so close to it and it's such a, 
very tight program, but at the same time, we're fortunate in being able to have a, a sport, a business, and everything all in one. And uh, people who can do that are rather fortunate, I think. Sport, business, a life all in one for the mechanic and the team owner. That's it. For the driver, it's his sport, his business, his life, and maybe a way to dusty death. For any race driver, the skills of high-speed driving are important. For the Grand Prix driver, they are only the starting point. At this level of competition, skills are so finely honed, so exceptional, that they pass into the realm of the unnatural. About 25 men out of a world of billions have what it takes to be a Formula One Grand Prix driver. They pressure each other constantly, worrying, harrying their brain. Playing a psychological game at the edge of human control where the slightest miscalculation can mean blinding pain, agonizing death. pressure, the unrelenting pressure of it all. No wonder they are coddled, provided for, spared the irritating details of day-to-day -day life. It's the team manager's job to organize, soothe, get things done. That's what Alistair Caldwell does for the Marlboro McLaren team. I have to organize all the travel, make sure everything you know, moves from one race meeting to the next, all the spares, cars, personnel, hotels are booked. Uh, and then at a race meeting, I'm involved with just about every mechanical aspect of the car, preparing it, uh, making sure the tires are ready, the aero shows, talking to the drivers, liaising between the drivers and the mechanics, um, timing the cars, making decisions when the car stops. Early racers learned quickly that a good team meant success. A driver might be alone in the cockpit, but it took a lot of people to put him there. Undaunted, Ferrari continued to experiment and learn, bringing the team dramatic success through the years. This Ferrari team helped win a world championship for superstar driver Nicky Lauda. Strong team is vital, essential. But even the best preparation in the world is only that, preparation. Finally, a man must go out on the track alone to win or fail. Again, we must focus on the driver, that man-myth defying death, pitting his exceptional ability against the grim reaper's scythe. He lives in an international netherworld, bordered by asphalt and catch fences. In the beginning, drivers lived other lives, enjoyed other careers away from the track. But this driver can't. His life depends on it. When we started racing cars, because it can do 200 miles an hour, we buy it when it's got good service and it's a reasonable price. Because we know all of them can do 100 anyhow, and that's more than one wants. So the, the racing game doesn't really sell motor cars any longer. The Grand Prix race car is as far removed from the family sedan as a biplane from a rocket. But there are two major exceptions to the contemporary Grand Prix rule of total separation between race cars and commercial automobiles. Ferrari and Lotus. Colin Chapman of Lotus has had a long and successful career as both a team owner and a car manufacturer. Well, there isn't any real connection uh, commercially. Um, they, the two run themselves entirely separately. And it helps make good street cars. It helps to make out, find out what makes cars handle and so on. Racing is my hobby. Streetcars manufacture is my business, so that's how they, fit, how they fit together. For Chapman, the connection between Grand Prix and commercial cars is a matter of desire. A man loves cars. 
They are his life. Enzo Ferrari was cast in a similar mold. His traditionally powerful racing teams have influenced the success of his commercially produced cars. But these men are exceptional. They stand out in a sport that has watched public adulation swing from the vehicle to the men who risk their existence behind the wheel, the drivers, the myth makers. No driver can win unless he's got a car that will do it. He may be the finest driver that ever existed, but he won't succeed in winning race after race if the car won't do it. Possibly because of uh, my own experience and age, I'm not so pleased with the publicity. I don't, I don't like it. You very often will find that the result of a race will be given you when they won't say what the car is nowadays. In the old days, you never got mentioned as a driver. Louis Coteland, for instance, who did Sunbeams, said the only reason he had drivers was that he couldn't find a means of making the car drive itself. If a car drove itself, would we throng to see it? No. It's the man in the machine that draws us to tracks around the globe. Gentlemen, as you know, this is a very spectacular show. People come from a long distance to see you, and they have a lot of heroes among you. One of the things that we as promoters and race organizers like to do is show you off. I hope you will cooperate with us and participate in the parade today. The cars are different. Technology advances, styles change. But what about the drivers? The drivers of today, when they learnt the cars that we had, could handle them just as well and be as good. The driver of long ago, they had to be stronger in those days because the cars, you got them round corners with a great deal of muscular strength, whereas the present day car, you can almost get round the corner with two fingers. The steering is light and the, the cars themselves were unsteady compared to the, the magnificent cars they've got today. But the drivers, as drivers, are, are always exactly the same type. They're called by different names now. These men of speed, Lauda instead of Mazzaro, Hunt instead of Edge, but they are the same, the same breed. It is we who have changed. We demand much more of our heroes now. Well, now then, it's become a spectacle. You could say, in a sense, it's rather like the Roman games. The spectators go there to see frantic excitement going on. The 70s, a decade built of speed and spectacle. We crave excitement. Yesterday, a quick tire change could be the measure between winning and losing. Then, tires seldom lasted an entire race. Today, if a tire fails, that's it. The race is lost. No time. There is no time. Tire change competitions are now simply a show for the spectators. Witness this Ferrari team in action and try to believe, if you can, that this was once a noble and highly prized art. Now, oh, there's a team that remembers the old days. But Ferrari, well, they do try. And I suppose courtesy is more important than winning. You may leave now, sir. Au voyage. And the wind on your back. Spectacle. That's what we want. And on a Grand Prix racetrack, that's what we find. We watch man and machine hurtling by delicately maneuvering around and around the circuit at super speed, and we say, marvelous. Isn't he magnificent? Can he be quicker? Can he do it? Amazing. He's incredible, isn't he? And then we grab a beer and a bite, or perhaps wave at a friend, while out on the track, that man, those men, continue to shift and steer, brake and accelerate, and concentrate.
it's taken a long time to get here. A long time. And I'll just be careful whatever I do because I think a lot of people don't realize how quick they can have an accident or, you know, anything can happen to them. And uh, about my driving, I just take some time to get back to the normal speed and uh, just working on it to recover, you know, my speed as it was before. Cars get faster, designs more fantastic, but some things never change. Death never changes. We come to see man and machine, but it's the man we want to focus on. But do we really see him? Does he have an identity beyond being a mere extension of the machinery that surrounds him? You can't see the driver at all, really. He's semi-inclined. He's uh, c covered over with a visor and all the rest of it. Very necessary and so on. The cars are more or less the same shape and have the same features, uh, more or less, in the... Dreyfus was one of a dying breed, the independent racer buried by the wealth of prestige-hungry nations. In recent years, the cost of racing has escalated to astronomical proportions. Today, to be successful, a team has to be very rich or very lucky. So far, the Surtees team is neither. For a team like us, that's very, very difficult because we have to make drivers. We have to sort of try and find them in an early stage of their career and then build them up to where they become a, a very sort of valuable asset to us because of their performances and because, of course, uh, a top driver is worth a lot of money. And when you have uh, a team working on a fairly tight budget, it's impossible for that team to go out and buy one of the top people. So apart from making the car work, you've got to make your driver work. But first, a driver must be found. He must have the talent, the ability that places him in the most elite of driving fraternities. And if he is found, then he must have a competitive car and a strong, competent team. There's no driver so arranged by God that he is much better than anybody else. Any sort of success is due first to the car and second to the team as a team, including all the mechanics, the controller and everything. This man is backed by the wealth of a nation, Brazil, seeking international prestige through ground free success. Emerson Fittipaldi, he's a champion, but his wins came in other cars. In his country's car, he can't buy a victory. Why trade success for struggle? Well, I think the reason is, uh, is very easy. Just one reason. I always have been very... Uh, I had the ambition to drive on the Brazilian-made car and to have our own Formula One team. And uh, that's the reason that I changed. Still the car not competitive, but uh, we are working hard and we hope in the close future we have a competitive car and a competitive team. To win with his country's car, Maria Fittipaldi has shared her husband's dream. It's his car, it belongs to the family, it's a Brazilian car. And I think that for Emerson, uh, if he won a race with his car, it would almost mean more than winning the world championship. It'd be his big achievement. I think it's uh, not only for Brazil, but for motor race, it's very important in Grand Prix to have uh, as more countries as possible competing and building cars, not only drivers. Because now we have drivers from all over the world, but we don't, we don't have cars built all over the world. Most of the teams uh, build cars in England. Only Ferrari and Ligia Matra in France and Italy. And now we are the fourth country competing as building Formula One car. And I think that's important for motor race, not only for Brazil. Nationalism and racing, a good mix or an evil one? When Hitler came to power, uh, nationalism came in racing as much as in other things, natural politics, but in uh, auto racing, for example, uh, the German cars were painted white or silver, uh, the French cars were blue, the Italian cars were red, the uh, British cars were green, etc. We all had national colors, and it was much, much better than the others. 
racing is a truly international sport. The country of origin isn't important. So Hans Stuck of Germany drives an English car and thinks nothing of it. In the 30s, when his father drove for Auto Union, things were decidedly different. Some drivers, like Emerson and Fittipaldi, are fired by nationalistic fervor. But for most, politics is for places other than the race course. They simply want to drive. But there must be a car, a competitive car. And if a country doesn't provide it, Someone must. Jody Schechter has a competitive car. He knows the price of racing and the extra cost of developing a new piece of sophisticated machinery like a Tyrrell. He knows someone must pay the bills. These cars are too expensive to run without sponsors. It's not like tennis or anything else. It's, uh, it's an important part of our racing. In fact, I think if there weren't sponsors, we wouldn't race. So I think it's a duty for every driver and the teams and everybody to pay uh, attention to publicity. And I think the Formula One people generally are fairly good. Is this the new nationalism? Have we gone from Aryan supremacy to cigarette supremacy to liquor or tire supremacy? Has the world become das nicotine land? Sponsorship is necessary to ground free racing. But what added pressure does it put on the drivers? A sponsor doesn't want to be associated with a loser. But a dead man doesn't need a sponsor. He was 61. It is on the legendary feats of men like Nuvolari that today's drivers build their myths. The new driver must have a new philosophy forced on him by the fantastic speed of the world he inhabits. James Hunt knows this. And it saddens him. I don't want to die. And uh, it's, it's a source of, uh, it's a steady source of worry to me. You know, it's, it's the one cloud on the, su the sunny horizon of my life. You know, I have a pretty nice time. And I enjoy my racing a lot. And it, uh, it grieves me to think that uh, one is under certain pressure when you're, when you're driving, particularly in Grand Prix racing, which is, the cars are very fast and they are dangerous. Um, it grieves me to think that one's under pressure to get in, do one's thing, and then get out. You know, I, if uh, you know, if you're a golfer or a tennis player or whatever, you have a career and you go in and you do your thing, and you can go on as long as you're enjoying it. But in racing, one is sort of forced, in a way, to say to oneself, "Well, I've got certain objectives. I want to achieve those, and then I really, it's really silly to go on. Once you've achieved those, there's not much more to achieve. Uh, it's silly just to hang around, exposing yourself to the risk." any further. Grand Prix racing is more demanding now, almost beyond human control. The pursuit of speed, acclaim, and money have seen to that. And we demand more now. Our heroes must prove their worth again and again. Human failure is not allowed. A car can break, but a man must not. Nicky Lauda knows the dangers, the pressures, yet he goes on because that's what he does racing at the far edge of belief toward fame or oblivion. About cars and girls. What else is there? <laughs> so, I don't think drivers enjoy racing as much as they used to because I don't think the sheer exhilaration and pleasure that you can get 
uh, is there. I think it isn't that much fun. I mean, there's tremendous concentration required, as there always has been, but the demands made upon you, I suppose, don't leave much time for anything other than just sheer concentration on the actual vehicle itself. Whereas when I used to race, I mean, at least you could set the thing up and then you could see a pretty girl and you could blow her a kiss or wave or something. And, and you know, that sort of side, I think, is gone. I think it's gone of necessity. I think it's a shame. I think the drivers have lost the pleasures of that side of the sport. The physical demands of modern racing are incredible, and success must come quick, be constant, or it's back to the miners. Gunnar Nilsson knows this. He's a new kid on the block, and he knows he must prove himself because it's a very, very small block. The first thought you get when you get into a Formula One car, when you've done a couple of laps, you think, you say to yourself, no way, it's impossible, you can't do it. But then you get used to it, and you go on and go on, and in the end, you... It's going okay, but it takes quite a lot of time and you have to change your whole attitude. I mean, you really have to work seven days a week, very, very hard. Uh, it's long races. I mean, now we're used to 20-minute races, and now you do two-hour races. And the whole scene is completely different. I had to move closer to the factory. I have to be able to go up testing when they phone me in the morning, I have to be there in a couple of hours. You always have to be sta on standby. You can never say, oh, in two weeks' time, I take three days off. That's impossible. People put a lot of pressure on you, sponsors. You have to get results, otherwise you're out very quickly. Results are out. That's what counts. That's what the sponsor wants. The pressure is massive, unrelenting. There's a man out there on that track. His fuel line is ruptured and gasoline is spewing into his face. His body will be badly burned by the raw gas. During the final five laps of the race, he will not know what he is doing, where he is. But he will finish, and he will finish in second place, pressing the leader right to the flag. What drives a man like that? Why does he do it? For us? For himself? If you ask him, he'll say, because I want to drive. A simple answer, as simple and as complicated as man. Sterling Moss drove because he wanted to drive, and he drove English cars because he wanted to win in an English car. England is the spiritual home of motor racing. Most of the cars are manufactured there, and not a few of the teams are either owned or managed by British alumni. But if home is where you hang your crash helmet, then the tracks of the world are home for the handful of managers, mechanics, drivers, and hangers-on who make up the Grand Prix circus. Each year, more people in more countries flock to see this deadly circus perform. But each year, the men in the center ring become less and less visible to their clamoring public. I think the public have been sort of cheated in a way with, with engineering because it's been necessary to build cars to go faster. Now, to get a car to go faster, you have to make it more streamlined, you have to make it smaller, the driver leans back further, it cuts through the air better and so on. But by doing that, obviously, you shroud the driver in. And uh, I, think, I think the public like to see a driver's arms going round and, and, you know, and perhaps even sometimes seeing down into the cockpit. Uh, I can remember in, in one of the races in Monaco, it was so hot, I took the sides off my car. Well, then the big people could see everything. I mean, they could see, you know, my feet still working and that sort of thing. I mean, now, unless you can read the man's name on the side of the car and you know the colour of one vehicle or another, they're not very individualistic looking, not like, shall we say, the Maseratis versus the Ferraris of the 50s. This Ferrari is very similar to a Lotus, or a March, or a Shadow. But this is what makes a Ferrari, or a Lotus, or a March, or a Shadow very, very different from one another. The man behind the wheel.
the man, this man, who is the measure. The car must be an extension of the man. Science can help, the team can help. Like a fine violin, the car can be tuned to suit the man. But in the end, it is the man who must rule the machine. I think the one thing they have going now, the whole car is custom built. It's an absolute bit of perfection. Uh, they were a little bit more blacksmith jobs when I was driving, really. I mean, give you an example. Uh, I remember driving from uh, the Maserati team and going to the Italian Grand Prix. And to make sure the shock absorbers were right on the back, the dampers, you'd push the car down. If it came up any faster than that, you'd just turn a little bit until it, would, until it came up more slowly. And this was the sophistication of the, of the shock absorbing, the damping. And, uh, you know, if it, if it rained, you'd incline to let the tires down a couple of pounds, and that was about it. And you might change the roll bar to change the steering. In those days, one of the teams Moss drove for was Colin Chapman's Lotus team. Chapman is still a major force in Grand Prix racing, and as the times changed, so did he. Today, his Lotus racing machine is as finely prepared as modern technology can make it. Car preparation is a scientific art today. But science does not bleed and die. The point is that the gap, the gap between the wires is about a quarter of an inch, right? And there's 12 gaps. No, sorry, it's 11 gaps. Well, you can't count that one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, a bit. Ten and a half gaps, right? It's about a quarter of an inch, yeah. so it's only just over two and a half inches before yeah. that spring is pulled out. Once all the calculations are made, Chapman's driver, Mario Andretti, must give his humanness to the machine, must depend on it and direct it. This side on that side is not, because you're going down the bottom of the hill, it's flat. Do you think we ought to put a load more bump rubber in? No, I don't know. No. Well, then however, however... Colin Chapman has been a long time. This, all racing, is the big leagues, the biggest. Nowhere is racing a simple matter of winning and losing. It's always a matter of life and death. This is the bloody thread that binds James Hunt to the first man who ever challenged another to race, and to all the drivers who have come and gone through the years who have brought us to this day, to this race. story because this is our race. These are our myths, yours and mine. Our legends will grow from men like Nicky Lauda because he is a survivor. James Hunt because he is a winner. Patrick Depaye because he has immense courage. Men like Mario Andretti, Jody Schechter, Emerson Fittipaldi, and the rest, because they are Grand Prix drivers, because they dare. Clinging to the track are the ghosts of Chevalier de Cnut, Felici Nazaro, Tazio Nuvolari, Juan Fangio, Jimmy Clark. Deep in the smooth roar of this Marlboro McLaren, lies the barely concealed thunder of the Alphas, Bugattis, Mercedes, Maseratis, and Van Walls that are this car's royal ancestors. Deep in the corners of our eyes is that same tinge of bloodlust that brought the first spectator to the first race. It's all here, all the years, all the glory, all the mystery, all the excitement, all here. In this race, it will be James Hunt who takes the checkered flag. 
but it could be any one of the handful of drivers whose courage and skill has brought them to the peak of their profession and into our lives, into our folklore. The McLaren team celebrates the win while Patrick de Paillet is a quiet celebration of courage. Finishing behind Hunt despite a cockpit full of fuel. Finishing badly burned and collapsing, but finishing. This day, de Paillet is one side of the Grand Prix myth. James Hunt is the other. To the victor, the spoils, the glory, the all too fleeting adulation of the crowds, the demands of an insatiable media. steed unmounted, the flimsy armor removed to show the world that this technological knight is a man, a fragile, courageous man. James, can I talk to you for a moment? Was there a critical part in the race at all? Yeah, we're about four lazy laps, I reckon it's about three from the end, you know. Were you aware of Cloud in the race, or did you just no, want to get out in front? Where did Nicky finish? Finish was about 7-3. He was out of the points. Yeah. Um, well, he must have gone well, because I didn't lap him. He must have gone bloody well. Well, I was tired. I was nearly dead. The questions are asked. The answers magnified through a thousand, thousand lips. We wrap our myth in the trappings of victory, and it's over for us. For the driver, it is only a brief lull in a life that is lived by turns at peaks of courage and valleys of emptiness on serpentine tracks around the world. The world knows it, needs to know it, has to know it, voraciously consumes his life. But he is alone, just as all Grand Prix drivers have always been alone. Yes, we carry him with us, too. We carry his courage and daring. We take a part of him away with us. The part that does not burn or tear or bleed. The part that does not die. carry away the myth, our myth, while the man we leave alone, just as all Grand Prix drivers have always been alone. This is the Grand Prix story, the story of the men who make the myths. <laughs>